Right, well, thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> so in the last talk, we just we looked at the big picture of some of the stuff that's going on. We looked at this uh, exponential emissions curve, which humankind has shown no, no ability whatsoever to dent. And we looked at the global dynamics behind that. And we looked at the fact that we really need to stay within a... Um, not go higher than two degrees. That's the red charts at the top were showing us that. And th we looked at how much fuel there is in the ground compared to the amount we can burn. And we looked at the balloon squeezing ripple, uh, rebound effects and how piecemeal actions in any one part of the world or amongst any one group of individuals don't solve the problem. So what's needed is a, is a global intervention to leave enough fuel in the ground. And it's needed urgently because we need our emissions curve to do something like this. Uh, and we looked at briefly at a whole land and food um, question. Uh, and we looked at the fact that renewables, whilst they're really, really important, won't on their own sort the problem out for us. Uh, and there we go, I've got my clicker. So, so, okay, so what next? The question is, what next? So the first thing, and this is a must have, is that we need a global constraint on fuel coming out of the ground. And it doesn't matter how difficult you think it is to arrive at that deal by which the world agrees to leave the vast, vast majority of the, of the fuel in the ground quickly. It doesn't matter how hard you think that is, we have to have it. And focusing on that without distraction is really, really important for us. And I'll just mention that we've got some talks coming up in uh, leading up to Paris uh, and those Paris talks are a landmark moment, and it would be very good if we could get a long way uh, <coughs> at those. Okay, so in one sense, a lot of things track through to, okay, what can I do? Because all of us at the individual level, however important our, and powerful our, our professional roles are, we're all specs in the global system. So the question is, well, what can any of us do that actually helps to create the conditions under which the world agrees to leave the fuel in the ground. So when um, Duncan and I wrote the book, uh, we came up with three things. So this global constraint, we said, OK, well, we, in order for that to be possible, we need to wake up. We need to crack this mystery of how can our species keep its head in the sand so effectively. And we need to work out, and it's not about applying the usual tactics to engage people. There must be something about the psychology we haven't understood. And if we can understand what that was, then perhaps we'll be dramatically better placed to, um, uh, to deal with the problem. And there's something about leadership there, which is that it looks to us as though the world's, the world's politicians and the world's leaders have been pitifully lacking on this. And uh, there's a, just a void to be filled. And the interesting thing about leadership is that it can come from anyone in any context. And a bit, a bit more about that later. It's clear we need to push the right technologies hard. And I want to talk about uh, a little bit about the role for technology. Because, you know, since 1850, we've had an awful lot of technological development. And on balance, it's gone hand in hand with a rising emissions curve. So it's not as though technology on its own just solves the problem for us. It doesn't at all. Some of it helps us, and some of it doesn't. And if we're selective with it, which we haven't been to date, but if we become selective with our technologies, we really could make a difference. So once we're leaving the fuel in the ground, renewable technologies are going to be really helpful to us. They will enable us to have the same energy consumption that we've had in the past and to live in the, um, the way that we want to live and, and possibly even to develop in whatever ways we want to develop. If we can develop the technologies for, keeping car for taking carbon out of the air and putting it back into the ground, then that would be really, really helpful for us. So carbon capture and storage, and maybe even getting carbon out of ambient air. And some people say that that technology is decades away. But if we really focused on it, and don't forget that at the moment we're investing 600 and something billion dollars a year in finding new fossil fuels and finding new ways of getting them out of the ground through fracking and shale and Arctic and stuff off the shores of Iceland and so on, then uh, if we diverted that 600 and whatever billion dollars a year and put it into those technologies that can help us, then that would, that would go a long, long way. So it's not as though the, the, the resources aren't there to be found. We just need to redirect them. 
And then there's this whole land and food system that we need to deal with, and that's about, that's a, uh, that's about diets, and it's about agricultural techniques, and it's possibly about sequestering carbon, and it's about a lot of research in order to, um, to get that going. And it's about cutting down waste. And I sort of say this last point without any enthusiasm, but we'd probably better have some kind of a plan B, because we are on an exponential curve, and it does double every 39 years, and we haven't shown any sign whatever of being able to dent it so far. I think there are some calls for that. I think there are some signs that we might be able to do that in the future, actually, and I'll come on to those in a minute. But given our failure, total failure so far, we would be uh, unwise not to be thinking about how we might deal with two, three, four, or more uh, degree temperature rises, and we would be unwise not to be thinking about uh, how we, what's going to happen to global order under those sorts of circumstances. But I don't say that with any w enthusiasm. So what about this global brain that hasn't been working properly, this breakdown between rational analysis and, and um, between, the, between rational analysis and action? So there have been various explanations for that. So what is it about the climate change puzzle that has caught us so off balance? Because we're such a great species at solving problems, aren't we? We've solved so many problems in the, in the past. One way of looking at it is a kind of evolutionary challenge to say, well, you know, we, a little while ago we lived about like that. That's just my little caricature, caricature picture for it, in a way that our, local, our impacts were local. And we had to understand our local impacts, and we needed to have a local empathy. And, no one in the, we've, and we've got that quite well. You know, no one's gonna, in this room is going to hit anybody else, almost however cross we might get with anybody else, because you know, we've learned to manage that sort of thing. We, we, um, we understand yeah. local impact. So we've good at, we're quite good most of the time. There are some exceptions, but we're quite good at local stewardship. But we're not in that world now. We've developed a whole load of technology, and now we're in this world. We're in the world where just about everything we do has a global impact. You can't buy something without affecting people, without having trig without having supply chains behind it that have people on the other side of the world working on it and emissions going on and resources coming out of the ground. Nothing we do in daily life virtually doesn't have a global impact. So but have we got what we need to go with that, which is the global awareness and the global empathy and the global stewardship? Or is there a kind of piece of human evolution that hasn't caught up yet? We've done all this technological evolution, and now we're in catch-up on the whole other side of human evolution. So maybe it's like this. Maybe you know, we've got all this physical capability. We've developed this side of ourselves, and now we've got to massively catch up on our stewardship capabilities um, as, as fast as we can. So this question, you know, why has the evidence been ignored so long? I'll just go through some of the explanations for that and some of the things we might do about it. So one is it's too complex. You know, we're dealing with this, this climate change thing. It's such a complex issue, and it's about, this, um, it's about this abstract gas that you can't even see. We're told we should care about it. And uh, we're told we should care about it because sometime in the future it's going to hit us in some abstract way that we don't properly understand. It's full of uncertainty. And somehow we're expected to engage with that, not just at a cerebral level, but at an actual emotional level. And we don't yet have the skills for doing that. And some people say, well, it's because we've got this optimism bias. We've got this bias that says, um, you know, we always think we'll be OK. So most people, if you ask them, think they're much more likely than average to win the lottery. And most people think that they're going to live longer than average. And most people think that their kids are going to be brighter than average. And all this stuff, we all go around with this optimism. And there's, there's a good side to that. There is a very good side to that. And there's also maybe a dangerous side to it that we think we're going to be all right. And I've heard climate deniers say, look, we, should, we don't have to worry about this problem because our species will be fine because we've always been fine. Which is interesting when you think about it, because if you think about it, every being that's ever existed from any species on the planet Earth could always say that and about its species until such time as it went extinct. You know, it had always survived everything that had ever been thrown at it. So it's a kind of a very meaningless thing for a living being to ever say. Um, but we've got this optimism bias, which we need to be selective with and cautious with. And we've got a confirmation bias, which is that we all have a tendency to go and only look at the evidence which supports the stuff that we already think. And so there's something about being open-minded and helping each other to be open-minded about confronting different worldviews um, from the ones that, that we're used to. 
And some people frame it up as a bigger than self problem. The trouble with saving your own carbon footprint is that you save a few tons of carbon and that doesn't really affect your own, cli your own climate very much. It only becomes worth it if you think, well, I've actually, I've made a minuscule beneficial effect on seven billion people's lives and their kids' lives and their grandchildren's lives. And when you scale it up in that way, which is a very abstract piece of thinking required to do that, it suddenly becomes incredibly worthwhile. But we need to empathize, we need to care about the minuscule differences we make about people on, to people on the other side of the world who are never going to walk up to us and personally shake us by the hand and say, God, thanks very much for doing that. And somehow we need to tune into that. I think my experience of this is that actually we all do when we stop to think about it a bit more. And I, I'm the same. The less I think about it, the more I ignore it. And if I, the more I stop to think about it, the more I kind of tune into it. And collectively, we need to help each other to get better at that. Too much vested interest is a very practical financial thing about the, the, the money in the fossil fuel industry. And there are very practical things we can do about that, like divesting in fossil fuels and choosing where our pension schemes come from and investing elsewhere, investing in renewables and that kind of thing. So there's very practical things we can do about that vested interest. And there's this thing about it's too comfortable to carry on and, and too difficult to whistleblow. And there's something, I think the message for me in that is that actually we just need to gear up and do things that are a bit uncomfortable. We need to be prepared to challenge um, talk and action that's inconsistent with dealing with climate change wherever it is and however habitually normal it is. Um, this social inertia thing. So if the fire alarm goes off now, we won't all jump out. Well, you'd think we'd all go out of the room, wouldn't we? Actually, we won't do that. The evidence is that we'll all look around to see whether anyone else is going out of the room. And if there are enough people are going out of the room, then we'll get up and go out of the room as well. So there's a whole social inertia thing. And there's a bad side to that, which means we've been very stuck. But there's a good side to that which means that the first people who start to move actually make it a lot easier for the next person to move. And I've been quite struck by how powerful this, um, this effect is. So I, I had the experience recently of getting on a, a, a very crowded commuter train out of London, which I don't often do, and it's absolutely packed. And by the time it's gone a few stations down the line, it gets fuller and fuller and fuller, and it gets to the point at which People were standing on the station platform, and yet if everybody really shuffled down the carriage, everyone could get on quite simply, actually. And I found myself standing there, sort of mumbling a few things to people about how, why don't we all budge up a bit. And I, afterwards, I found myself thinking, well, why was it so hard? What I really should have done, what all of us should have done, is just say, come on, everybody move down, those people on the platform there. They just want to get home, just like all of us. You know, if we all shuffle down, it won't cost us anything. Everyone else will get on the train. And yet there's something very uncomfortable. And some people are better at that than me, at doing that kind of thing. But something very uncomfortable about standing up and, and you know, standing up for uh, what you know is the right thing to happen just because other people aren't doing that. And we all need to just, those of us who care about climate change, just need to gear up and be bolder at that. Uh, I think this lack of alternative vision has been a massive stumbling block because all the careful scientists and politicians who've got onto climate change have spent all their energy uh, trying to get the science across, trying to um, do battle with climate denial and quite mischievous Vest, um, vested interest that has been trying to s very successfully stirring up confusion around basic things like the science. And that hasn't left any energy left for looking at what the alternatives are. Because it's not as though a low carbon future is a doom and gloom future. Um, and particularly, I mean, in, in, in somewhere like Iceland, that's very easy to see, actually. There's a great opportunity for you in a, a low carbon world, and you guys would be, um, you guys would be in a great position. But that alternative vision needs working up. Actually, there's plenty to play for here. We need to look at how the world does its economy in different ways. But it's not as though we haven't got opportunities to improve our well-being and uh, improve all sorts of aspects of how we do life while we're at it. We need to do some re-engineering. And we need to do some careful thinking about what that looks like. And it hasn't had anything like the level of heavyweight thought that, um, that is required for it. Some people are just saying our species isn't up to it. Um, you know, 
all these things are just catching us off balance. Our species is just not up for dealing with something as global as climate change. And I would look at it very differently and say, actually, our species is very good at solving all kinds of problems. And it's very good at evolving. But the, what it needs to do is realize what the challenge is. And once we square up to the challenge properly, actually, we'll get moving quite quickly. Um, or we can get moving quite quickly. So how should we respond? So what is kind of at a kind of more individual level. So what does this mean for us? So I think the first thing is uh, we all need to get to grips with the global dynamics properly and understand these rebound effects and understand that we need a global intervention on this. And we can all help by facing the facts as they are, say, saying the truth how, how it is, and really critically insisting that everybody else uh, says the truth how it is um, and, uh, and is direct with us. And by that, I mean insisting that our media does that, choosing your newspaper carefully, uh, at work, if you find yourself in a, in a conversation where there's a bit of surreptitious climate denial going on, just challenge it. Um, you know, there's, there's a role for all of us in that. Um, as for me, there's something about accepting ourselves and each other in all of this, because we can all beat ourselves up. We're all hypocrites. We're all imperfect. Uh, and so is everybody else. It's so, it's so tempting to... Uh, walk away from the problem ourselves because we, we suddenly find that you know it's quite climate change presents quite a few personal challenges for us, and we need to get to a point where we kind of accept ourselves for the fact that we're imperfect because that allows us to engage. But we also need to accept everybody else for it as well. It's so tempting to split the world up into the good people who are trying to deal with the problem and the bad people who are trying to make it worse. And actually, we need a far more nuanced an empathetic understanding of the worldviews that lie, lie behind all this, because it's not about a fight. It's kind of, the way I see it, it's much more of a, it's much more of a kind of um, a process of, of constructive engagement. So if I had a role model on this, it would be Nelson Mandela. You know, he didn't create a perfect world in South Africa, but he did, against the odds, avoid a bloodbath, and he did it by working with people rather than framing them up as the enemy, which must have been incredibly tempting. Okay, um, how do we get around this future problem? Uh, think of ourselves. Uh, think about our kids and their kids. And I think this is a really, uh, you know, powerful thing to do because our kids will look back at us, and whether they ask us, they probably won't want to embarrass us. So they might not ask us the question directly, but they, we know they'll wonder. You know, when, come on, you know, mum and dad or grandpa or granddad or whatever, you know, when you got to the point when you saw clearly what the climate change situation was, what did you do about it? We know that question will be in the air. And surely, there will, you know, will they really, what will they think if we just say, well, well, I just carried on really because everyone else at work was carrying on and everyone around me was carried on. Well, you know, will they really expect us to have done that? Surely not. And I think that thought of how that sort of sense of having let them down is surely something which, if, you, if we focus on it, don't we all get a sense of, God, I, I really wouldn't want to be in that situation. So focus on our kids and theirs, um, and take our whole selves to work. So I talk to people, quite a few people, who kind of compartmentalise themselves. Outside work, there's somebody who thinks about climate change and cares about the world and cares about their kids, but inside work, we've got to be practical and it's all about money. And actually... We have, to, we have to do away with that separation. We have to take our whole selves into the workplace and be unembarrassed about it and encourage and enable other people um, to do that as well. Um, imagine opportunities. We need, to, we need to work up opportunities properly. Um, there hasn't been anything like the emphasis on that uh, that we need. And that's going to be about new thinking and it's about breaking habits and it's, and it's going to be about having some bravery and, and some conviction behind it all. But I want to talk about... Uh, causes for optimism, because I think it's so easy to be doom and gloomy about this, but I feel a lot more optimistic than I felt um, a year or two ago when The Burning Question was published, for example. So when The Burning Question came out, I was saying, look, I am not going to spend the next five years complaining that nobody is listening, because it really felt as though the world just wasn't listening to basic evidence. Now it feels as though the world is beginning to listen to that evidence. So the US-China deal that's come out recently, we need a lot more than that. And I'll sh I've got some slides in a minute to show you how close or how far that takes us. But uh, it's a lot more optimistic than the kind of talk that was around even just a couple of years ago. And 
I work with some businesses, you know, quite big businesses, who are getting it that a carbon-constrained world could be a business opportunity for them. These are multi-billion dollar businesses <coughs> who, are getting, who are starting to understand that. For me, that's headway. And the need to leave the fuel in the ground is actually quite widely accepted now. And a few years ago, it, it wasn't at all. And with that comes signs now of vulnerability in those fossil fuel assets. Well, maybe they're going to collapse. Wouldn't that be fantastic? You know, so there are signs of things happening. And the, but the biggest thing that makes me optimistic is that we know from, from history that tipping points can happen really, really fast. You can have a situation where that social inertia feels so locked in the whole economic system, the way we're doing life, the way the fuel's coming out of the ground, feels so locked in and nobody's listening and we feel as though we're just banging our heads against the wall. And actually, then you start to see a few little cracks like the ones that I've outlined here. And it could be just a very small space of time between those cracks really widening up and suddenly there's a cultural change, an economic change, a political change, and the whole thing's happening at once. And the next thing we know, the whole world is scrambling for a low-carbon world. And I actually think you know, that could be a very fast process from where we are now um, you know, over the next you know, maybe even year or two. We don't know, but the harder we push, the greater the chances of it. I'm just going to show you quickly what I think about the, about the US carbon deal. So, so they've put a few pledges on the table. And the, the, uh, the top line there is the trajectory we're on for global emissions up to 1830. And if, this is my just rough sketches, if the US and China and the EU all kept to their pledges, which is a big if, and if the rest of the world followed suit and mod mirrored the kind of average of EU, China, and the US, which is, again, a big ask, because it means we've got to get Russia and the Middle East and all sorts on board, and everybody carried on their trajectories through to 1830, we'd be on that blue line there, which has deviated from the exponential curve, which is a breakthrough, because we've never managed to do that before, so it's a landmark moment. Now, it's clearly not enough, and if you look at the cumulative emissions, the cumulative emissions looks like this. By 1830, there's virtually no change whatsoever. So you can see how inadequate what's on the table is at the moment, even if the rest of the world came into the fold. However, have a look at these next graph. What if everybody agreed to twice as much? By which I mean China agreeing to um, cut its emissions growth by twice the rate that uh, would put it on the trajectories I've shown so far. And the EU and the US doubling the carbon cuts that they're saying they're going to do, and the rest of the world doing all of that. And suddenly, you'd end up with trajectories that look like that. This is the one for the whole world. And I've drawn it now up to 1850, so you can really see what, uh, what happens. And that's the cumulative curve. And it really is, by, by, sorry, by 2050, by 2050 uh, it really is starting to uh, top out. So I'm not saying there isn't a massive way to go, but I am saying that I think we're seeing the signs that the world is finding the right levers, and it's starting to put its hands on the right levers, and it's just starting to tinker with, well, what happens if we pull that one a little bit? Which, and that's a lot better than flapping around doing the wrong things, which is what it looked like just a few years ago. All we need to do now is get hold of those levers very clearly and pull them as hard as we possibly can. So for me, that's a step change. But just before you all relax and say, that's fantastic, we're all fine, don't forget, that's the trajectory we're on, that's the cumulative commissions curve, that's the two-degree line, we're heading for it very, very fast indeed, and that's what we need to do. Thank you for listening.